absolutely love looking at our, all the smiling faces. It's so awesome to be here. I'm so honored to be able to preach today for midweek. I got a chance this week to reminisce on my days as a baby disciple. And I was like cringing as I was going through the memories. I don't know if anybody can relate when they look back on who they were. Yeah, so I was thinking of my first Bible talk that I went to in a crop top. Like, what was I thinking? I had to run back to my dorm and grab a sweater. I remember arguing about meetings of the body because I'd rather stay back and do homework. Silly things, being late to church, even though church was right on campus for me in New York City. And I remember one very funny interaction in one of my first discipling times with my spiritual mentor. And she told me that maybe I should study out pride. And I looked at her and I was like, no, I don't think that's it. (laughs) And I remember then sharing this story with one of my friends, one of the sisters in the church. And I was just like, yeah, I think she just tries too hard to relate to me. She just can't relate to me. And the sister turns to me and she's like, you know what, Regine? The problem is you think she needs to relate to you when the Bible says enough. And I was so convicted. But what it showed is that I just needed to grow a ton But not only that, I needed a lot of people in my life. And it reminded me of this quote that I read. It says, conversion is a short trip to the altar, but maturity is married to time. Conversion is a short trip to the altar, but maturity is married to time. And throughout time, God's word seeped into me as it has into you. And we've been able to mature because each of the women and each of the people that God has then since placed in our lives had a strength and taught us something. In 1 Samuel 23, we're going to turn to 1 Samuel 23. We're going to see a little bit of David's life. In verse 16, the Bible reads, And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horish and helped him find strength in God. What a friend. Don't be afraid, he said. And I love this scripture because it shows that Even in something like this, it was someone else who taught David how to find strength in God. We're going to fast forward a couple chapters in 1 Samuel 30. In 1 Samuel 30, verse 6, the Bible tells us that David was greatly distressed. He was struggling because the men were talking of stoning him. Okay, okay. It it was a really tough day. It didn't feel tough. It was really tough. It says, each one was bitter in spirit. It gets worse because of his sons and daughters. But it says, but David found strength in the Lord his God. And it's so incredible because it was his friend who first taught him how to do that. Whether it was his discipler or his disciple, we can't really tell from their dynamic. They just helped one another. But David, in a time of trying need, he was able to find strength in God because his friend Jonathan had taught him how to do it. And we all need to find our strength in God. And I'm looking at women who do find their strength in God. You would not be here if you did not find strength in God. But what's incredible is that God purifies us And he purifies us through the people that he places in our lives. And it shows that we need one another. Discipling is something that's been lost in our society. Right? Discipling, even though it's about God's word and maturity, people have made it about authority. And people talking down to you. People not respecting you. Not thinking you're good enough. And the society that we live in parades this culture of independence being the highest degree of happiness you could ever get. Like, I don't need anybody. I am by myself. I don't need you. I don't want you in my life. But we know that that is a lie. The highest form of relationships we could ever have is interdependence. Now, what does that mean? Interdependence. It means... I can do this on my own, but I see that you can do this better. Can you teach me how? 
I can be good on my own, but can you help me to be great? Because I believe that God has great things in store for me to do. It's allowing people in our lives, coaches in our lives, and specifically in this context, spiritual coaches in our lives, to help us be the women that God has called us to be. But Satan's at work while God's at work. And so what is Satan going to do? Use pride. Use pride to prevent us from learning from the people in our lives. But what is God going to do? Grow us in our humility, right, so that we can hear from the people in our lives. I remember reading um, The Prideful Soul's Guide to Humility. Has anybody read that? Yeah, like after my Bible, it just, it just chops me up to pieces. But one of the phrases that it said in it that I will never forget, it says, sometimes God will not tell you what he's waiting for you to humble out to hear from the person he's placed in your life. Meaning that God is trying to answer some of those prayers that we've been praying on how to grow and how to change, but he's waiting for us to ask our mentors, our husbands, our friends, so that they can reveal it to us. And I think of Naaman the leper, how God told him what he needed to do and he just needed to trust and obey as opposed to waiting for a prophet to come down to heal him. But I even think of the Shunammite woman. She had a man of God in her life. But when he asked her what he could do for her, she said, I'm good. And yet God allowed this man to see the need and to help her to really grow. And this was Jesus' vision with discipleship. He wanted us to have people in our lives who could sway us, who could influence us to grow closer to him and ultimately to find strength in him. That's the Pro- Proverbs 27, 17 type of relationship, iron sharpening iron, right? And it takes those kinds of coaching. And so what I want to do tonight, right, I want to inspire us that we need discipling, that it's a privilege and an honor to be discipled, but that we can't make it to God without it. And so the title of my lesson is Five Golden Goals for Godliness. All right, we're going to turn to Amos 3, verse 3. And I have five points for you guys today, if you couldn't tell, five golden goals. And the first one is sign up to be sharpened. In Amos 3, verse 3, the Bible reads, Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Now, Amos is a shepherd, and this is a rhetorical question that he's asking. Like, obviously, like, we need to agree that we're going the same way so that we can go that way, right? And so what this is translating into is that we can never assume that someone wants to come with us unless we've asked them. And so even in starting any new discipling relationship, it's asking the person, hey, I do believe that God has placed me in your life to help you, and I want to help you. Your dreams are my dreams. Whatever you want to accomplish, I want to help you accomplish. But will you allow me, through the word of God, to help you to get there? And for the disciple, you have to sign up. Right? Allow that person to teach you and share those dreams and those goals with them. And so I want to break down some of the lingo because I see a lot of new faces in the crowd, right? So I've said disciple, I've said discipler, I've said D time. What do those things mean? So a discipler is a spiritual mentor, a disciple is a spiritual mentee, and a D time is a discipling time or a mentorship time. Just so you guys can keep up with me as I'm throwing these words around. And so it's really cool because regardless of the dynamic, right, God says that two are meant to walk together. And so like I mentioned, Amos is a shepherd, but he had young prophets in his life walking with him and teaching him. And so each discipling relationship is going to look different. My relationship with Mama Pam or Kim, who are much older than me, spiritually, to pour into me is very different from Jenna and some of the other girls, like Aubrey, who are younger and in college. But I learn just as much from the younger girls as I do from the older women. Because you can always learn from anyone when they have the word of God in front of them. 
And so the world, you know, in the Jewish culture, there was discipleship. It was the, the rabbi who would memorize these things and then regurgitate it to their, their, their pupils. But when God came onto the scene, when Jesus stepped into the world, he's like, no, what I want now is to be fully trained. Follow me. See how I live. See how I do things. And it's in that way that now we learn to imitate, not just regurgitate, but imitate. And so some people will say that they just need the Bible. They don't need anyone in their lives, you know, but that's not Jesus's method. You can't just confess to God. James 5, 16 says confess to one another. We need people in our lives to help us. And I love, love, love our church. I love our church. And we're part of the sold out discipling movement, right? We love mentorship. We love people watering us with the word of God and helping us. But ladies, you know what makes me so sad? Hearing that. For some people, it's been three months since they've had a D time. Hearing that they've reached out to their disciples or people have reached out to their disciples and they've ignored their text messages, their phone calls. People who are eager to be signing up to be sharpened and they're not getting that sharpening, right? We are holy, we're set apart from the world because we get to have this, because we get to walk together. And I want to encourage you all to really see that this is a privilege, but to really take on this role that God has given you as the treasured possession that it is so that you can pour into the women that you have in your lives. All right. Okay, point number two. Give them what you got and they'll do what it takes. We're going to go to John 15, verse 15. You guys with me? All right, go ahead and yell at me. Amen. Hallelujahs. Come on, sis. Preach it. I want to hear it. I want to hear it. So John 15, verse 15, the Bible says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. Now, I love this scripture a lot because Jesus doesn't just want to be our big brother, but he also wants to be our friend. And it says that part of that friendship is that he's going to teach us everything that he's learned. And for us, it's not just these authoritative hierarchical relationships, but these are our friends. And everything that we've been taught, we now get to share with someone else. And so when we are studying the Bible, think of the time when you were studying the Bible and coming to every Bible study was all of these scriptures. It was like a love feast of scriptures. It was almost overwhelming. Like, oh my gosh. Like I went from like barely knowing the Bible and showing up to church on Sunday to so much Bible, you know. But what happened? It was powerful and it started to change your life. You started to come alive, shackles and and things that you could not overcome before. You started to get the ability to overcome it. And what was that? It was God's word that was changing you. It was changing your heart. It was changing your thinking. It was changing the ways that you saw the world. But now we're disciples And we still need that love feast in our D times. We still need people to show us scriptures to pour into our lives, not just reacting what happened during the week, but being proactive to the goals and the visions and the places that God wants to take us. In Acts 2, 42, you guys are all familiar with this scripture. In Acts 2, 42, it says that they devoted themselves. And the they that it's referring to is the 3,000 that just got baptized at Pentecost. So they just got baptized. They went through this love feast of scriptures as Peter preached the word to them. And it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They gave up everything for God. So they had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, 
praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. Isn't that incredible? To just be able to see the first century church thriving, 3,000 just get added to their number, but immediately you see the students' hearts. They made a decision, I'm going to be devoted to God's word. And because of that, they were filled with joy. They were filled with awe. They started to see the miracles, but more than that, other people came and were part of those miracles too. And even as our disciples are teaching us and pouring into us with scriptures, we also have to make a decision to devote ourselves. It's not them chasing after us to set up a D time, right? But it's us like, when can I have a D time, please? You know, can we schedule it? Can we go after this? And they saw so much value in the word that they started to build up the kingdom. It wasn't about what they could take from God, but it was what they could give in gratitude to God in building it up. And so I love that, that they were so eager to learn. And some of us were more eager for a raise than to raise up for God. Right? We need to take that same ambition that we used to have in the world, and now we need to have it in God's kingdom to do whatever God has called us to do. Because God wants to use you. Do you believe that? That God wants to use you. God wants to use you. And the only way he's going to be able to do that is through the word of God. Right? But I get it. We're busy. We're booked, busy, and blessed. Okay? Okay. And so I get it. D times are important. I get it. I need to have them. But how? I have a full-time job. I have three kids, two grandkids. I'm doing a master's program. You know, like we're so busy. We have so much in our schedules. And so how can we make this happen? One, I always recommend to just get advice on your schedule. You know, what can be pushed back? What can we do? Um, Another thing, too, I want to introduce a new concept into our lingo. A lot of you already know this, but for those who are new, a D group, right? A discipling group where maybe every other week, instead of having individual time, say you disciple two, three, four women, you pull them all together for a time of sharpening. And it's not just you sharpening them, but them sharpening one another, right? And it frees up some of that time where you can devote it to other things that are needed in the week, Um, But what do you teach during your D times, right? Many of us have been around for a while. We've heard a lot of things. We know these concepts already. But going out and and teaching some of the things that maybe Jason preaches at his staff lessons. I'm constantly learning and constantly growing because of that. But also, we're having quiet time seven days a week, right? That's seven days of material that we can teach to the people that we're leading or that we're continually sharpening on the questions that we have right? Don't reinvent the wheel. Teach what you've been taught, right? Because when you're able to give them what you got, they'll do whatever it takes. All right. Point number three, no growth is really gross. No growth is really gross. Let's turn to Hebrews chapter five. In Hebrews 5, we're going to start in verse 11. Give me an amen when you're there. (laughs) It's like, hey, hey, hey. Amen. (laughs) Hebrews 5. Amen. (laughs) For real this time, amen. (laughs) Amen. (laughs) Hebrews 5. We're actually going to pick up in verse 12. It says, in fact... (laughs) Though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. Now, I love this scripture because it shows that God's heart for every single person is that they become teachers, right? I remember um, doing Bible studies with Karina, and in her Seeking God study, I remember sitting down, and I'm just like, you're a leader 
And she's like, okay, you know, if you say so. I'm like, you're probably a TA. She's like, yeah, I am. And I was like, wow. And so God's given you the gift of teaching. And so when you become a disciple, you'll be able to teach other people. And it's been so encouraging to see her invite so many of her friends to study the Bible, to be able to share her faith, and to be able to grow. And it's so incredible because tonight she's going to become our sister and become a baptized disciple. But I remember when we first probably heard this message, we're like, we're just figuring it out ourselves. Like, how can we go and tell somebody else? Like, that's a lot of pressure. But then we come to find out, like, wow, God believes that I can do this. Wow. And the person who's sitting across from me, they were in my shoes one day. And so if they can get there, I can get there. But it says that these people had stopped trying to understand. And really what it was is they stopped growing. And so instead of maturing onto this next phase and this next stage of life, they still need to be taught the basic elementary teachings over and over and over again. And why? It says because they weren't training themselves. They weren't training themselves according to scripture to distinguish good from evil. And so imagine this, right? Does everyone know baby Camille? <laughs> Kiara's like, yeah, that's my baby girl. Right? So Camille is, is she one? Yeah. One, almost two? Yeah. And so she's one. Imagine if in five years, Camille still looks the same, feeding from a bottle, wearing diapers, when she's six years old in like what, second grade or is first grade? That would be weird. You'd be like, what's going on? Like, somebody needs to help Camille, right? And so it's the same thing that happens to us spiritually when we don't train ourselves according to the word of God, right? We're many years into the faith, and instead of being able to help other people, we're still needing to be taught. And I've been there. I've been there. I've been in D times where people are teaching me things and showing me scriptures like, I remember this one <laughs> from last week. From three years ago, you know, and being taught the same thing. But in those moments, it's incredibly humbling. But it also helps me to see, like, wow, God is so patient. Like, he's just not going to leave me behind. Or he's not going to teach me new material before I've actually grasped onto what he's already trying to teach me. He's waiting for me to catch up and to take heed to his word so that I can actually keep pace with him. And so if you feel like you're there, that you've stopped growing, it's not too late. God has not given hope on you, and I hope you have not given hope on yourself. Right? God wants to use you, but it's having the perspective like, man, not growing is not good. I can grow, and God wants me to grow. And so part of that growth is allowing people into our lives to not just give us advice, but to take their advice. Right? John 8, 31, 32 says, when we hold to the teaching, we'll know the truth and be set free. And so sometimes people will tell us things that we disagree with, and that's okay. They'll tell us things that we don't like, and that's okay. But try it. See if it works. Because then you'll get to know the truth and be set free. Try something different and take the advice. I want to encourage everyone to come out to the leaders' meetings that we have on Sundays. You know, it's an incredible time, not just for the Bible talk leaders, but for anyone who's a leader. And if you're a disciple, you're a leader. Congratulations, right? God wants to use you, and it's going to be an incredible time for growth. But another part of growing is surrounding yourself with spiritual parents, you know, surrounding yourself with people who can teach you different things. So even in my marriage, I actually imitate Sarah in the ways that she brings things up, how she brings up conflict. Um, there's a woman in my life, her name is Brandon Speckman from New York. She would always tell me how sometimes she just randomly smiles at her husband. And so guess what I do? I randomly smile at my husband. And sometimes he thinks it's weird, but he always smiles back, you know, and he always feels encouraged. But I learned that from her just like years, years ago. I process my emotions like my mentor from SF, her name is Ashley Sarkodie. She's like, you cannot rationalize before you emotionally connect. And what that does, it allows me to feel heard by God before I get to what I know I need to do. 
right? But there's different women who've been placed in my life to teach me different things to be able to do that. But not only that, if we can't submit to a woman, how can we submit to a man? Some of us want to date, but we don't have wives. We haven't allowed wives to be in our lives to teach us what they did and to imitate those things. And so this works in every sphere of life and not even just spiritual parents, but also spiritual peers. I wanna lift up the campus women. It was so cool because a couple weeks ago we had a D group together and after the D group, they made a group chat without me and what they've been using that group chat to do, yeah. (laughs) And what they've been using that group chat to do is to confess their sin to each other and to encourage each other, and to send memes, and to be friends. But man, I look at them, and I was just like, wow. It's not just me that they'll need, but they'll be able to help one another, even far beyond me. And so creating group chats in the church, who are your peers, right? Not just having a close relationship with your mentor, but with your peers. People in your Bible talk, really being family outside of these times. Okay, point number four. We're coming around the bend. You guys with me? All right. Point number four. If you care more, you'll be careful. If you care more, you'll be careful. Jesus said it's not the healed or the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Right? And in Job 13, we see that his friends were trying to encourage him, but they weren't careful. They didn't ask questions to seek to understand. They were just judging him, telling him what he didn't do. And it wasn't helpful information at all. But if you care more, you'll be careful. You'll understand that the person that you're talking to has had past traumas, has triggers, are sensitive, might have had a hard week, a hard day. And so coming in with questions instead of assumptions about where they are or what they've done or what their motives were. In Matthew 18, we see the the story. You can just write it down. In Matthew 18, we see the story of um, the son who's wandered off or the lost sheep who's wandered off. And right after that section, it talks about forgiveness. Why? Because people hurt us. They hurt us when they leave. They hurt us while they're here, you know, and we're continually needing to forgive, to purify our hearts, to cleanse our hearts so that we can give our whole heart to the next person or in the next situation. And in 2 Timothy chapter 2, we'll turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23. Come on, amen. She's got it. Is everybody else there? (laughs) I love that you remembered. I forgot. So in 2 Timothy 2, it says, guys, I was discipled on this for an entire year. So I have like four different versions memorized. Like it was so bad. But it says, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because you know they produce quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Opponents must be gently instructed in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of the truth, and that they will come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who has taken them captive to do their will, to do his will. And I didn't always appreciate the scripture. I always felt judged by the scripture, actually. I felt like it was calling me dumb. But that's not what it's saying. God's trying to protect me from being dumb, in fact. (laughs) But it says, don't get into arguments. It's better to hold your tongue and think and pray. I think Brianna does an incredible job of that. I was asking her, how do you keep your calm in every situation? She's like, Well, I know if I say something now, I'll make a bigger mess that I have to clean up later. (laughs) You know, I was like, that's wise. That's wise. And so I'd rather stop to think and pray before I make my next decision or before I say something different. 
But it says that we must be kind, able to teach, not resentful. If you're getting frustrated with the people that you're leading, you've almost lost the ability to lead them. Right? They need to feel that you feel fired up about them. That you believe in them. That their dreams are your dreams and their goals are your goals. Right? They want to know that you actually care for them. And people don't care how much you know. Until they know how much you care. And so this scripture teaches that. But it says that when you go and talk to them, gently instruct them. Right? In the hope that God will grant them repentance. Sometimes we're discipling people on the same thing over and over again. But in between the discipling, we're not even praying for God to grant them the grace to repent. We're expecting that our teaching or our scriptures are going to change them as opposed to God being able to do a miracle on their hearts to transform them. And it says that what's really going on in the background is that Satan is taking them captive, trying to do his will. And so we can't play God expecting that people repent from us, right? We have to let God be God, but we have to do our job in terms of being able to teach, not resentful, being kind, and gently instructing. And in Deuteronomy 13, it talks about inquire, probe, and investigate thoroughly, right? Sis, I know you said this, but what did you mean by that? Sometimes the delivery is questionable, but the point can still be taken, okay? But even as disciples, we also have to be a worthy example for them to be able to imitate, right? Having consistent quiet time, sharing our faith, having good purity, you know, so that we can have a challenging life that inspires them um, to be able to do more. And so if you care more, you'll be careful, All right, my last point, point number five. I love you guys. (laughs) I feel like we're having a moment here. Number five, find the gold and cover the mold. And the whole point of this scripture is look for the good. You know, sometimes we can see the things that people aren't growing in. You know, it takes no talent to be critical. But it takes a lot of discipline to see the good, and it takes a lot of compassion to be human and to acknowledge that you have the same thoughts and you've struggled in probably the same areas and with the same things at some point, right? In 1 Peter 4, verse 8, the Bible tells us, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Find the gold and cover the mold, right? Your discipler is a sinner just like you. They're going to make mistakes. They're not going to always know the right thing to say. They're not always going to understand you in the way that you wish they could understand you. They're going to be weaker in you than some areas and stronger than you in other areas. They're going to make mistakes. But in those times, God says that your love will cover a multitude of their sins. Love over their sin and find the gold. What can they teach you? We should be able to look at our disciple and at least see one strength that we can imitate, that they have that we might not have. And you might say, well, you don't know my discipler. You, you don't know what her life looks like. But think about it. Samuel was under Eli. David was under Saul. Ruth was under Naomi, and Naomi self-proclaimed herself as bitter. And yet she was still able to find a husband, okay? Like, Naomi was still able to teach her. She was still able to grow so much. Same with David. He still became king, an incredible king at that. And so we can learn from anyone. And in Hebrews 10, 23 to 25, you can go ahead and write that down. It says, consider how we can encourage one another. We have to be able to remember that they were a miracle, right? And as we're pushing them to greatness, it's not forgetting that they're amazing in this radical process of transformation that they've gone through. It's no longer, it's still valid, right? And it's about being able to push them forward. And uh, many of you have done chemical recovery or emotional recovery, and they give us a template for discipling, which is red, 
relate, encourage, disciple, right? So before you go in, finding a way to have compassion on the person. Like, wow, sis, I can totally relate to that. Like, I've been there so many times. In fact, let me tell you how worse it was when I was there. But I just want to encourage you, and I just want to inspire you. You are so amazing, and you are going to overcome. And one scripture that I think will be incredible if you build this conviction is this, right? Feeding it to them in a way that they see that it's because you believe in them and not because you've looked down on them, right? Find the gold and then cover over the mold. There's this TED Talk by um, Viktor Frankl, who in his old age started airplaning, just flying airplanes. And if you've ever been on a plane and you're looking at the map, you see that it looks like a rainbow. It's never like a straight shoot, right? And they use this technique called crabbing. And they fly in a rainbow because they know if they go straight, they'll most likely miss their destination. So they overshoot to account for the wind and different things like that so that they can actually land at their destination. And I think how similar that is to discipling. If you take the person for who they are, they'll never get to who they were meant to be. But if you overestimate them and push their potential and expect greatness, they'll actually become the person that God has called them to be. And so we have to look at them not for who they are, but for who what they could be in God. And so I have one challenge. Just one. Just one. Sometimes I give too many practicals. I just have one. And it's to ask the woman of God that God has placed in your life and one other person you trust, what are two things I can really grow in? If you're really bold, ask your husband. Embrace yourself. And allow this person to speak the truth in love to you. And then go after it. I want to close out in Isaiah 62. Isaiah 62, verse 3. The Bible teaches you will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. Okay, so why this scripture? One, I know we're all royal priesthood, holy nation. God looks at us and he sees princesses and queens. But a diadem is means the tiara of a king or the tiara of a queen. And I found this quote that I just thought was so emblematic of discipleship. And what it said is, real queens fix each other's crowns without telling the world it was crooked in the first place. And so with these five golden goals for godliness, signing up to be sharpened, giving her what you got so she'll do whatever it takes, no growth is really growth, so expecting greatness, caring more so we can be careful, and finding the goal to cover the mold. We are fixing each other's crowns without letting the world know that it was crooked in the first place. The world is narrow, and sisters, we need each other to get to God where we'll get our true golden crown. And so I know I'm looking at women who are their sister's keeper. I'm looking at women who want to grow more and do more and lead more in God's kingdom. But most importantly, I'm looking at women who are fit for godliness. And I love you all. Thank you for allowing me to preach to you all tonight. And to God be the glory.